All right, so then let's do this. Let's call the meeting to order. And Will, would you please take the roll? Sure thing, Madam Chair. So we'll start with uh, committee members that have registered for the call. Uh, Idaho Representative Rod Furness. Here. Uh, Indiana Representative Matt Lehman. Here. Minnesota Senator Paul Lutke. Here. Missouri Representative Bob Titus. Montana Representative Nellie Nickel. New York Assemblyman Ken Blankenbush. Here. New York Senator uh, Pam Helming. New York Assemblyman Pam Hunter. Here. Oklahoma Representative Ellen Hefner. Texas Representative Tom Oliverson. Utah Representative Jim Dunnigan. West Virginia Senator Eric Nelson. West Virginia Delegate Steve Westfall. Here. Okay. Uh, Non-committee members, members that have registered for the call, Hawaii Representative uh, Therese Amato. Uh, Michigan Senator Lana Thies. <clears throat> Here. I know we just did. There she is. Um, North Carolina Senator Paul Lowe. North Carolina Senator Natasha Marcus. Here. North Carolina Senator Vicki Sawyer. Nevada Assemblywoman Shay Backus. Here. South Dakota Representative Mark Willardson. West Virginia Delegate Walter Hall. Here. And we do have Chair Felskowski. Uh, are there any other legislators on that I did not call? Michigan Representative Brenda Carter. Uh, th this is Assemblyman Ken Blankenbush, New York. I'm not sure you got me when you called my name. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Jared Candalfo, also New York. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we'll just need a motion to waive the quorum requirement. Do I have a motion to waive the quorum? <coughs> Do I have I'll a second? I'll second. second. So we have a um, motion and a second. All those in favor, please verify by saying aye. 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 Was paused. Thank you. So with that, um, good morning, everybody from Wisconsin. I can say good morning over here and good afternoon to those that are on the East Coast. And I would like to say thank you for everyone for joining us today. We have two model laws on today's agenda to discuss, both of which we would like to try and get across the finish line by our annual meeting in November. That may seem like a tall order given the complexity of the issues today, but I think that's why we're meeting and um, these interim meetings are a good tool to continue conversation on the models in between our national meeting. We'll start with a continued discussion on the NCOIL Transparency and Third Party Litigation Financing Model Act. We had a very productive um, discussion on this model at our spring meeting in Nashville, where we heard several different perspectives on what the best approach is for the model going forward. And I'll first turn things over to the sponsor of this model, Indiana Representative Matt Lehman. Representative Lehman, please go ahead with it. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, everybody from beautiful Bern, Indiana. Uh, it's a beautiful day today, and I'm, I'm in my office with all the doors closed, so I don't know if, if it's still beautiful, but it was earlier. Um, first of all, I wanna thank everybody who's, who's reached out. We did have, we've had good participation. I've got a lot of feedback since uh, this first came out in, in discussion in the past, and then you know, first introduced as a model in March. Um, as Madam Chair indicated, we've had a productive meeting in, in April, um, and many of you have reached out post that about uh, from both legislators and interested parties. So thank you. As you can see on the website, uh, including the meeting today, is a copy of the West Virginia litigation financing law that was passed earlier this year. I've included that in the material at the request in, of uh, my colleague and co-sponsor. Uh, West Virginia uh, Delegate Steve Westfall. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and you'll have that. You can you can look at that. 
so some of the comments today, if you have suggestions when you look at that uh, as to what might need to be brought over into this model, I'd like to hear from you today on that as well. So if I can, let me let me take a step back for a second. <clears throat> it seems like from from what came out of the, the Nashville meeting, there's kind of, I'll say, three core issues that have really been kind of the theme of a lot of your correspondence. Um, one has been the splitting of the model between the commercial and the and the consumer. Um, and uh, we can have that discussion, but I think it's, it's you know, what we try to do at NCO, and you've heard me say this before and I'll say it again, is, you know, to have a, a good foundational uh, piece of legislation that you can take back to your state. If you take this back to your state and split those in two, so be it. Um, but right now, I think I, I would like to see us continue this discussion on this one model. Um, and again, we can have that discussion. Uh, there's We've had a lot of discussion on the, the amount of consumer lending can charge. Uh, consumer lender can charge. Currently, the model is set, I think, at 36%. Um, or do we just be silent, let the states decide? You know, some states have different usury laws than others. And so maybe we, we take that approach of let your state uh, meet whatever standard they have. <clears throat> and then the last thing that's kind of been a standard has been, are there circumstances under what circumstances um, should the lit litigation funding agreement be disclosed? Uh, we, what we did in Indiana and what's in the model is this, the existence of West Virginia has, I think, a little bit more of a deeper uh, that you know, is more of a model provide for that agreement to be provided outside of discovery. So I think that's a discussion we need to continue to have around via discovery or like West Virginia um, have that more of a, of a provision in the agreement. Um, I think that's a, that's a valid discussion because I do think there are things within those agreements that, that we may have uh, that may play a part in all of this. So those are the only comments that have been out there. Uh, those are the three main buckets, I guess, so to speak. <clears throat> a few other thing, factors that have come out that I think are worth discussion. Um, one was they're around the definition of who the bad actors are. Uh, we have their foreign governments that are the, on the list of bad, bad foreign governments. Should that be expanded to include bad actors individually? We have Russian oligarchs that the federal government says you can't do business with these people, not the entities, not the governments, but the individual people. Um, and there's, there's, there's the data out there, resources out there to reference. So maybe we look at expanding this to the bad individuals, not just the bad countries. Um, do we, Montana had some language around capping the amount of the fees funders can collect. So there, you know, maybe that's a different incentive as you're going to put money in is to know your return on your investment, um, may not be what you think it's going to be. And then just some miscellaneous definition, I think changes around to, for some clarity and consistency. I know I got some back from some that just literally went, you know, line by line and commas and, you know, different things. That's, that's all good stuff. You're going to have some squibbers notes that we're going to have to, to fill out with all done. So <clears throat> what I want to hear today from comments really are, if anything, we need to change in the model before we meet in, in again in, in uh, July. Uh, they don't necessarily have to relate to these specific issues I just listed, uh, but I want to hear suggestions and how we can make this model more effective. Um, I feel we all agree that we must address at some level the practice of showing that the potential disruption of this in our balance of scales of justice. Um, I think you're seeing more and more evidence that this is distorting our judicial system and return on investment should not drive litigation. Um, so I can't stress enough my willingness to hear your comments. And if you've worked with me in the past, you know, I'll listen to everybody. We may not agree, but give me your, give me your ideas and we'll try to find a, a place we can all land um, uh, successfully. Uh, so continue the conversations. Uh, the model law develop doesn't isn't fluid. It, it's, it, it needs to be fluid and more collaborative. So again, don't be bashful. Let me know. And again, thank you to everybody who's already done that. I'll, I'll stop there, Madam Chair. I look forward to the discussion today. Um, I want to know, I think this is a great opportunity for NCOIL on an issue that's getting a lot of national attention for NCOIL to take the leadership position and get the states to a place where they have the ability to act on this. And so while it may take another meeting even after July, I really, as, as Madam Chair said, we do want to get this to a place where we can go back to our uh, our respective chambers and get this out uh, into the next session. So with that, um, I hope we're ready to vote on this thing come November. With that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Representative Lehman. Delegate Westfall, would you like to make any remarks as co-sponsor of the model?
Well, I think uh, Matt did most of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, we did pass this this year, the Senate Bill 850, with bipartisan support. It actually was almost an agreed to bill with the uh, trial lawyers and everybody. It passed the Senate 34 to nothing. It passed the House 89 to 11. Uh, they tried to put something in it, and a couple of members of the House uh, voted against it because they couldn't get an amendment in it. But being that, I think West Union model is a pretty good model to go with, along with what Indiana has. We got the disclosure in it, who, who these people are. Um, I like to see part of ours, if not all of ours, West Virginia. The chamber helped a lot. The U.S. Chamber and West Virginia Chamber of Commerce helped a lot with this model act. And I think it's a pretty good piece of legislation. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Madam. Great. Thank you, Delegate Westfall. In terms of format, um, as we move forward here, we're going to open things up to interested parties that would like to speak. And then after that, we'll go to any legislators for questions. First up, we have Jack Kelly. Jack, please go forward. Uh, yes, my apologies for not being on screen. I have a, a, a challenge here. I'm in uh, Georgia, Indiana. And bad, bad visual, right? But everything else is beautiful up here. Uh, you know, I, I I appreciate the the comments by uh, by uh, the, by the the leader on uh, on the foreign money. One of the things uh, I would maybe look at there, uh, Representative, is we could just do the sanction list. Uh, that goes Jack, directly. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Could you please tell us um, who you're representing as you speak? Oh, I apologize. I thought most people knew. I apologize, Madam Chair. My name is Jack Kelly. I'm with the uh, American Legal Finance Association. Uh, we're the association of companies that do uh, consumer uh, funding, uh, not commercial funding. Right, and uh, the provisions that I'm talking about are on the commercial side of the disclosure of uh, foreign uh, money. But if, uh, if uh, we want to address uh, bad actors, you can just go to the sanction list. Uh, the sanction list issued by the Department of Treasury uh, delineates individuals uh, besides delineating uh, companies, uh, countries uh, and enterprises. I think that that would, uh, in a major way, shape, uh, address what you're talking about, uh, uh, Representative Lehman, and get to a much broader uh, parameter uh, to get to the individuals. Uh, on the consumer side, uh, I've suggested a couple of changes I've discussed with Will and others, which are uh, truly technical. And I don't want to belabor uh, the members of the committee with, uh, 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 you know, those type of issues that I think I could we could work with staff on. Uh, this bill, a very similar bill, uh, passed the New York State Senate, uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Rep uh, Senator Cooney, a member of NCOIL, uh, two days ago, 62 to nothing, um, which addresses the uh, consumer side. It does not address disclosure because... To be very honest, if anybody knows anything about New York, uh, the New York uh, trial bar is extremely uh, uh, challenging to deal with. So uh, the bill that passed is uh, is the bill that uh, minus the uh, disclosure items in New York and addresses the uh, consumer uh, side of the business. With that, I'll, uh, I'll I'll stand down and be happy to answer any questions by the uh, by the members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I'm going to, I should have said this, any interest party wishing to speak, please feel free to jump right in or use the raise hand. And also, again, please let us know who you're representing. Up next, we have Eric Schuler. Eric, did we lose you? I think he might, he was on it. He might have dropped off. So if you want to wait till want to go to the next speaker and then uh, we'll go to him when he gets back on. Okay, then we have Dai Wei Feeman. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dai Wei Chin Feeman. I work at Parabellum Capital, which is a commercial legal finance provider. I'm here on behalf of the International Legal Finance Association, or ILFA, which is the trade association for the commercial litigation funding sector. Um, I was invited recently to participate in this. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to speak very briefly about the about where I come from and, and kind of the commercial sector's perspective on this. Um, and, and I just generally say I look forward to working with everybody. I will have a colleague who's coming to Costa Mesa in July who used to work at Liberty. So he's a good guy for this. Um, but generally, um, just some background of what we do. We do mainly business to business litigation investment. Um, it is not personal injury in nature. So I think that's a pretty easy place to draw the line 
consumer commercial, personal injury, non-personal injury, either is fine with us. We don't really have a dog in the fight on the consumer side. That's really issues of consumer protection as far as we're concerned. We do pre-settlement business to business litigation predominantly. These are cases where there is rarely um, and almost never insurance on the other side because these are things like breach of contract, antitrust, international arbitration, and patent infringement. Um, so there isn't really a lot of intersection with insurance. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of insurance companies that, that invest on our side of the V doing judgment preservation insurance or collateral protection insurance for, for plaintiffs. Um, so it's actually, there's actually a lot of overlap positively in synergies with insurance and funding. So I wanted to make that clear. And also that I don't think we're really on the other side here of insurance interests, um, given that, you know, there really isn't insurance on the other side of the types of things that we do. Um, in light of that, again, consumer is not really our issue. Um, we also don't object to anything about, you know, foreign adversaries dismantling our legal system. Really, the, the issue that's important to us is disclosure. Um, there is, uh, this is a model law. I'm actually kind of confused here because this looks not to be like an insurance law. It looks to be like a litigation funding bill. Just so everyone knows, the litigation funding regulatory push is Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber driven. If you go to the website, it's a big priority. Um, I'm surprised this is being considered as a model bill, given that only a few outlier states um, in the country that are not major hubs of commercial litigation funding have passed these bills. I think it's no surprise to know that there's an almost no documented proof of any litigation funding on the commercial side happening in Indiana, Montana, or West Virginia. And that's no coincidence. Um, these are states that our industry doesn't particularly have a big interest in, given that there isn't a lot of commercial litigation there a big ticket stuff that's worth kind of tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so the chamber has sponsored dozens of bills over the past couple of years, and they've succeeded in four or five states. And none of these tends to be the ones where, at, where there's really any proof that this industry even exists. So I'm confused why this would be a model legislation. But in any event, I think I'm excited to share kind of correct misconceptions and, and hopefully take a data-driven approach to some rational regulation here, which we totally support limited disclosure to, to identify conflicts of interest, things like that. But any disclosure of an actual funding agreement is going to be highly prejudicial to the parties. It's a roadmap for the defense to know the litigation budget and the return. It's the equivalent not of getting an insurance policy done before the case arose, but instead of getting the, getting the defense budget and the defense strategy and insurance and information on the reserves. It's not in parity with insurance disclosure requirements. It's, it's very different for a lot of reasons I can explain. We don't have control over these cases. We're not indemnitors. Um, and, you know, generally it's, it's just very different. So I, I think as long as rational regulation recognizes that we don't want to prejudice the, the parties that need the funding to begin with, we don't want a David versus Goliath suing a Goliath, who, by the way, doesn't have insurance on the hook. We don't want them having to take outside money because they can't otherwise afford lawyers, but then that creating a new defense to their defendant it now has a roadmap to bleed them dry. Because when a case is funded, it's not funded with unlimited dollars. Investment funds that, you know, uh, have limits, just like every, everybody else, we have, we have duties to our own investors and can't, you know, overcommit the money. And um, so anyways, um, there's just a lot of differences with insurance. And as long as we protect against prejudice, so if there's discovery about a litigation funding agreement, it should be clear that, uh, there's nothing prejudicial that's disclosed. All sensitive terms must be able to be redacted, but important things like who the funder is, so there's no conflicts of interest. Statements that the funder is not unduly controlling the litigation. That's all fine, again, as long as there's protections against prejudice. And I, I look forward to working with everybody towards kind of a reasonable solution here, because I do think there's an opportunity to do something new, not like Indiana or West Virginia, which are outlier states, but things kind of in the middle that recognize this prejudice. It's something that actually the Federal Rules Civil Advisory Committee has been grappling with since 2014. This very issue sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. They've done nothing that whole time. And if you read their agenda books, they're not really interested in it because it's pretty clear that this is a, a chamber driven initiative that is only intended to help big business. And, and in light of that, it's a very partisan issue. But I do think if there's a if there's a rational approach that recognizes both sides and the legitimate interests here, then it is a real opportunity. I look forward to working with everybody and, and answering any questions here or offline. Uh, as Eric Schuller knows, on the consumer side, we're, we're both out here in the game of education largely and just making sure people know there's a lot that can be said about our opaque industries. We're really just trying to protect the interests of those that we fund because they need us from an access to justice perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Eric? Yes, thank you. And I apologize if I missed it because my Wi-Fi decided to hiccup while I was in the middle of this phone call here. So um, one thing I just want to address is, is kind of going into 
what some of the things that Representative Lehman said is, first of all, is hopefully dividing this into two separate pieces of legislation. Uh, I've had some conversations with some of the members of the committee, and there still is a lot of confusion as to what it is that you know the consumer side does, what it is that the commercial side does. And I think that confusion would just be exasperated if it went into one piece of legislation. So that's one of our recommendations. The second recommendation that we've had is, again, what Representative Lehman brought up, is kind of maybe toning down on the disclosure aspect of it in that it was just be acknowledged that, yes, the consumer has one of these transactions. Secondly, that it then follows a normal course of rules of discovery for that particular state not giving more weight or less weight to either side. But then finally, in the end, then it's inadmissible against the consumer because we don't want to have someone being able to go into court and, and use that piece of information that they had to get some financial assistance to pay their rent or mortgage or keep a roof over their head to be used against them in, in the courtroom. And then finally, I've looked at several model bills uh, from NCOIL and have not seen any in which they limit the profit restrictions of a particular company in it. And I don't know if necessarily that NCOIL wants to co kind of go down that route a little bit, uh, limiting the profits of companies and what they can and cannot do. As Representative Layman has said, and uh, you can look at our website, there have been a variety of different types of legislation passed on this, some with restrictions, some without restrictions. And I think that should, should be something that should be left up to the individual states to make that determination. We believe in a free market solution that the free that the market should dictate what that it is and it should and should not be charged to these things. And then finally, on the, just a couple of issues to kind of uh, uh, reiterate my initial point of being put into two separate pieces of legislation. One bills that were highlighted talking about Montana and also the bill that passed this year on West Virginia, those specifically were on the commercial litigation financing end of things. Um, and by putting it into one piece of legislation, it really, you know, again, muddies the water up as to what, what uh, can and cannot. And I think it just puts a lot of confusion as to what things are being talked about. I've heard things of, you know, people talking about, well, you give someone on the consumer side, you give someone, you know, $3,000 so they could pay their mortgage and keep a roof over their head. And now it's leading into a $20 million verdict. That's just not the case. So I think we just need some clarity on that. And uh, again, as a, as a model bill, it should be as generic as, as possible. And then each, let each individual state take it as they need. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Eric, sorry, just to jump in. Madam Chair, just, uh, uh, just factually, in terms of NCOIL models, uh, the, the prior statement wasn't correct. So I just uh, like to get that right. to the record. We're going to let but, everybody speak, and then we can have questions at, at, a, at a later time. Okay. Um, Danielle? <laughs> You are up next, please. Hi, my name is Danielle Waltz. I'm an attorney at Dinsmore and Shoal in Charleston, West Virginia. And I wanted to say I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm here in my personal capacity, but I did work with several clients in West Virginia, including the U.S. Chamber and APCIA um, on, on the bill. Um, and want to echo what Delegate Westfall said that, you know, in West Virginia, the bill that included the disclosure requirement was, was supported by a number of parties included the Association for Justice, who actually testified in favor of the bill. Um, I worked on the bill in 2019 in West Virginia, actually, with uh, Eric Schuler, who's on this call, was, was there with me when we worked on that bill the first time around, and then again on these revisions. And primarily, um, you know, I believe the legislators thought it was important to extend the disclosure requirements to commercial funding. Um, this litigation financing is something that Sunshine's just beginning to start to, to shine on, and by allowing the disclosure, um, making the disclosure mandatory as the West Virginia legislators chose to do, uh, it just puts sunshine on the information and gives all parties a level playing field in litigation. I'm happy to answer any questions about it, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, applaud the work of the group on the bill so far. Great. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Patrick Hanna. Did we lose Patrick? Uh, I'm, I'm here, Madam Chair. I withdraw okay. the question. No need for the acknowledgement. Thank you. Okay. And then we're going to go back real quickly to Di um, for some brief comment. Thanks so much. And just um, Eric's comments reminded me that in 2020, the Uniform Law Commission uh, conducted a study as to whether to issue 
model legislation similar to this. It was also a chamber sponsored initiative and the Uniform Law Commission, we had a process run by um, Professor Cassandra Robertson Burke at uh, Burke Robinson, excuse me, at Case Western. Uh, there's a memorandum associated with the ULC's conclusion that due to the so many differences um, in states' laws on these issues for issues ranging from champerty to usury to whatever, they said it wouldn't be appropriate for uniform law. Um, I'm going to dig that up and circulate it to NCOIL just so it's added to the library for everyone to consider. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Do we have any other interested parties that would like to speak? Okay, if not, um, I'll now open it up to the legislators. Are there any questions or comments from the legislators? Again, please jump right in or use the raise hand function on Zoom. If nobody's going to jump in, I will. This is Delegate Steve Westfall from West Virginia. I hope we can pass something. I really like what we did in West Virginia, Indiana's version of it and stuff. I think the disclosure needs to be a part of it. We were really concerned if any type of suit, who was funding it. And we saw some cases or heard some cases that, you know, there's some, some countries and stuff and people that we shouldn't be doing business with and shouldn't try to wreck uh, havoc with some businesses in West Virginia. That's why we passed it and passed it pretty overwhelmingly. Hope we can do some amendments and pass some stuff in July and then vote on this in November in Texas if possible. So I hope we can get something done. Thank you, Delegate Westfall. Any other legislators? All right. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm going to turn things over to Representative Lehman for any closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the all the comments and we'll continue this discussion. I, I guess I want to uh, take a little bit, I won't say exception, but a couple of the comments that I guess really kind of bother me in this whole vein of this is when I hear the terms being used about, well, we're not interested in the, in the non you know, big ticket states. You know, the big ticket things, we, you know, Indiana, Montana, West Virginia, that's OK there because we're not doing litigation funding there. We talk about elimination of profits, return on our investment, free market. I I just if you can, you can please help me understand where our founder said we need to create a judicial system that's fair and balanced where you can get a good return on your investment. That's the one area that I don't think capitalism and free markets really should reign is in our judicial system. That's me personally. I'm just kind of, I'm saying, I hear from people saying we need to you know, make more money, make more money. I don't think the judicial branch is where that should be. I do think there, there's true evidence too of, you know, where you got to make sure that everybody has access. And there's going to be times I need to be able to have that access. That's why we're not doing a total prohibition. You know, there needs to be some parameters around this. So I, I look forward to more discussion. I look forward to Cosa Mesa. And I, I think that uh, we're going to have some a good result in the end. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, thank you, Representative Lehman, and thank you to everyone for your comments today. Um, we're going to move on, and we're going to have a lot of time to discuss this in Costa Mesa. And for anybody that's interested, if you have some other comments or questions, you can always reach out to the legislators on the committee to further discussion in between now Costa Mesa and even um, Texas. Please be sure to reach out to uh, Representative Lehman, myself, or NCOIL with any other comments on this or um, any other legislation. Next and Madam Chair, I'll add, them, I'll add them to my file. Okay, <laughs> there you go. You got it. Next on our agenda is a continued discussion on the NCOIL Earned Wage Access Model Act. We had very good discussion on this at our spring meeting in Nashville. And since that time, the first draft of the model has been distributed, which you can view on the website and with our meeting materials. And I'm going to be turning things over to the sponsor of the model, NCOIL Vice President, New York Assemblywoman Pam Hunter. Assemblywoman Hunter, please go ahead um, with this model. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, great to, to see all of you. Uh, apologies for not being able to see you in Nashville in April. Um, I think maybe you had one of our members, but for, for the rest of us, uh, our budget was not done and we were a couple weeks late and uh, it was very difficult for us to uh, to be able to get away knowing that um, we need to get the state's budget accomplished. But I'm here with you today and and thank everyone who participated in the discussions on this issue since we first introduced it in uh, November. 
Uh, a lot of what Representative Lehman said regarding litigation financing model applies here in the sense that it's a great opportunity for NCOIL to provide guidance to states looking at this issue. Obviously, you can't watch anything on television without actually hearing about earned wage, wage access. You don't hear those specific terms, but it's basically getting paid early uh, for work that you've already done. Um, and our conversations here come at a good time. Uh, because when you look at the states that have taken action on this issue and passed legislation, they've taken different approaches. So we can use this model as an opportunity to review and discuss what states have done and what maybe should be included in the model and what shouldn't. Uh, earlier this month, South Carolina became the latest state to pass an earned wage access law, and last month Kansas did. That brings us to five states that have earned wage access law, so our conversation here is very timely. Turning to the model itself, it essentially mirrors the bill that has been introduced in my home state of New York, but I want to stress that I'm open to suggestions on anything should be changed, and I believe all of you did get red line changes um, that were forwarded as recommendations from some interested parties. Um, we can use this New York bill as a starting point and do hope that we can get something discussed again at our July meeting and then um, get something to vote on in November. So I would uh, give this back to you, uh, Madam Chair, for any discussion. Okay, thank you, Assemblywoman Hunter. In terms of format, we'll first hear from Mick Campbell, Commissioner of the Missouri Division of Finance, who has joined us today to provide some remarks on Missouri's experience with its earned wage access law. Commissioner Campbell, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, Senators, Representatives, it's very nice to join you all today. Uh, just for a little background on Missouri Division of Finance, we're responsible for the oversight of 194 state charter banks with about $190 billion in assets, as well as almost 2,500 non-depository uh, licensees. Uh, EWA was first introduced last year during our 2023 session, was passed into law uh, as part of a larger uh, omnibus bill. And in Missouri, we have a five-month session each year from January to May. And uh, for a new concept like this to be introduced and then passed in its first year is pretty rare. So most things, you know, two to three years for something like this to get done. And, you know, admittedly, we really didn't have, as a regulator, uh, you know, didn't know a, a ton about EWA at the start of that session last year uh, and didn't have the benefit of several sessions to kind of get acclimated to this new concept. But certainly, you know, discussions both, you know, before and during session, and then after passage with industry, both association groups and individual companies, as well as the sponsors, really helped us kind of gain a, a comfort level uh, with this EWA space. Uh, yeah, it was enacted, so it went into effect August 28th of last year. So we had a short period of time from uh, passage in May to uh, enactment, uh, but we did have a, a license application that went live to industry a couple weeks before uh, August 28th. And I think a lot of the questions we had from industry kind of going in uh, to enactment, what, you know, once it was enacted is, you know, just kind of the timing of things, you know, we're going to do rulemaking or not, uh, would rulemaking delay implementation, hamper reliability to move forward, uh, you know, with the enacted language. And we really felt like the language that was passed in Missouri, uh, which obviously was an industry initiative, um, was, you know, pretty straightforward. And uh, the way we like to do rulemaking is to kind of give a new concept like this a couple of years to kind of season so we know better where, you know, clarity may need, be needed by reg. Uh, but we did start accepting those applications, as I said, uh, right before enactment date. And uh, within about, I think, the first two weeks or so, uh, we had a 10 licensees, and right now uh, we have 29. So I think about this time we anticipated maybe having 15 or 20 uh, licensees, but uh, we have a few more than that. But this isn't, all in all, I mean, this isn't like some huge kind of crush, you know, of hundreds or thousands of applications. Uh, there's just not that many players uh, in this in this space. Uh, really not any pain points that I could point to for Missouri in, in our experience so far. Like I said, industry was, uh, you know, communi communicated very well. You know, their representation in Missouri, we have a very good relationship with uh, and communicate and very transparent with. So I think that really helped uh, the process both for industry, the legislature, and, you know, for us too as the regulator that was going to be taking this on. But I did want to maybe point out a few things for you all uh, to kind of maybe be on your radar for, you know, peers of mine in your state, you know, questions they may ask or things that, that may come up as part of the process as uh, this model act 
uh, starts to uh, uh, be introduced in more places. But like, I think going back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, just kind of lack of awareness and understanding. Uh, we didn't really know much about it, uh, but we have a pretty open mind here. Not all of my peers may be as open-minded uh, about this, uh, you know, kind of new type of product or service that they don't know a ton about. So I think, you know, education is, is very key. And, you know, I think there, you know, the Model Act itself, uh, you know, I think the legislation and oversight is, you know, it's beneficial to both citizens and industry. So I think trying to tie that in uh, could help help make you successful. I, I know a lot of my peers will get hung up on whether these are loans or not, and most will be adamant that they are. I'm really indifferent on the topic. I mean, once we now that we've had a chance to kind of learn more about the uh, the industry, uh, I mean, I, I'm more inclined to believe that they really technically aren't loans, uh, especially for the employer directed product. Uh, but that'll probably be a question and and maybe a sticking point for a lot of state regulators. Uh, also, assessment of fees and charges and whether those are limited or not, especially for states that have usury rate caps for lending already. I mean, I've had a chance to go over the Model Act. I do think that a lot of the concerns I just mentioned uh, have been addressed in the Model Act compared to maybe what was passed uh, in our state back in 2023, which should make it more palatable to a wider range of state regulators, in my opinion. Uh, as I mentioned, only 30 licensees so far, so budget. FTE concerns or burden to me is very minimal, and we've easily been able to kind of include this in our regular capacity for non-depository oversight. We've had no complaints on EWA, both before licensing was required and after licensing was required, so we've not had to conduct any investigations or uh, haven't got to the point of having to conduct uh, regular exams either. So uh, a couple other real kind of maybe real quickly technical situations that might come up is when is a license actually required? I think we would like to have some kind of de minimis, you know, like, and this work goes employer direct, where, you know, they have a thousand employees in one state, but they have two or three remote employees in a couple other states. If they're doing an employer directed product, you know, does that EWA provider have to be licensed in those two states where they just have one employee? Uh, I think the way that the model act reads as well as what was enacted in Missouri, the answer to that is yes. Uh, but I think it would do both regulators and uh, industry a lot of, uh, it helped them out quite a bit. If there was some, and I don't know what the number is, five transactions, 10 transactions a year or clients uh, or 100, I don't know what the number should be, but some maybe some type of de minimis uh, would be very helpful. And then you may see some uh, state regulators that want to push for bonding requirements in this space. Uh, to us, we didn't feel like that is necessary or, or even down the road as EWA is much different than say money transmission licensing or mortgage li licensing where you know surety bonds do play uh, an important role uh, kind of to the nature of those products and, and the monetary risk to citizens. So uh, with that, happy to take any questions later once it gets opened up. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may interrupt just for a moment, um, I'd just like to extend um, as Vice President uh, of NCOIL to Commissioner Campbell. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. It's it's very rare when we have these interim committee meetings that we do get uh, commissioners from different states and participant, uh, participant regulators to join us. So we really appreciate you uh, being here today. Thank you so very much. Thank you, yeah, Madam my Chair. Pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. And again, thank you, Commissioner. Let's now hear from other interested parties. Please feel free to jump right in or use raise your hand um, function on Zoom and you will be recognized. And please also remember to state who you are representing. Ben, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, Chair Hunter, Commissioner Campbell. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think this is now the third time I've had the opportunity to speak to you. So again, thanks so much for everybody's time. Um, we think this is a great effort. We want to work um, with everybody. Ben, please um, tell us who you represent. Oh, sorry. Ben LaRocco with Ernan. Um, uh, we submitted uh, some suggested red lines to, um, to the bill that uh, um, we uh, believe uh, make it a little bit more um, applicable across uh, states and um, a little bit more applicable for uh, our businesses to be able to continue to operate. So um, just want to say thanks for this pro uh, thanks for the process. Uh, we want to participate as it goes forward, and I look forward to working with the legislators. Happy to answer any questions about the specifics of the of the red lines um, as the process goes forward. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ben. And then we have New Economy Project. 
Hi there, it's Andy Morrison. I'm the Associate Director at New Economy Project. Um, and it's it's great to see you, um, Chair Hunter. Um, appreciate uh, all the work we get to do together in New York. Um, just wanted to weigh in about um, our position on uh, earned wage access. Um, we represent you know groups across the state. We've been doing fair lending work in New York for many, many, many years. Um, and just want to point out that, you know, from our perspective, EWA, particularly uh, with the B to C model that's exemplified by companies like Earnin and others, is not a new concept. It's a very old concept known as usurious lending. Um, and we think that most problematically with any model legislation and bills that have been advanced in New York are provisions that exempt these products from our usury law. Um, in New York, we're one of, I think, 17 states that have really strong usury laws that have effectively barred payday lending, which extracts massive wealth from black and brown neighborhoods in particular. And um, we don't want to see that, um, that uh, EWA products circumvent that really strong protection um, so that they can charge usurious uh, rates that extract money from those communities. So just wanted to um, share that. That's, that's most fundamentally um, our issue that uh, these products are, if they want to operate, they got to do it under the usury law. All right, thank you. Up next, Penny. Hi, my name is Penny Lee, President and CEO of the Financial Technology Association, a FinTech Trade Association association representing um, the fintech industry, of which includes the earned wage access uh, products and companies. And just want to say thank you to the Vice, Vice President Hunter, Chair Hunter, um, having had the pleasure of testifying in front of your committee in New York. Appreciate all your effort and your leadership and your work on this bill. And what we've seen is that the American public, the, the American worker no longer is the two week or one month pay, pay cycle no longer applies oftentimes to their own economic needs and their own liquidity needs. And so these type of products are really helpful to those to try to meet those short term gaps and those short term needs um, because the two week pay period oftentimes doesn't fit their own needs. So appreciate the work of this committee of Chair Hunter and others in a very collaborative and very deliberative process. Uh, to be able to come to this model law that we have to give clarity to other regulators, uh, other states as well. As you've seen, there has been a lot of questions with this new product in the marketplace. Different states have reacted in different ways with five having the model law passed, others reacting. So I think it, it's incredibly helpful to have an organization such as NCOIL take the lead on this model law to be able to provide that clarity. So appreciate everyone's leadership on this. Thank you very much. Lauren Saunders? Hello, I'm Lauren Saunders. I'm the Associate Director of the National Consumer Law Center. Done a lot of work on earned wage access. We work for economic justice for low income and vulnerable clients. Um, we, we have both concerns um, about some aspects of the, the draft model law, and I also see some positive aspects of it. Um, I support the fact that you're taking a different approach from Missouri, South Carolina, and the other states that have adopted laws so far. Uh, those states, none of them, they all allow payday loans. They do not have rate caps. And the approach of exempting uh, the <clears throat> advances from lending laws and having no cost limit whatsoever is not appropriate in states that protect people against predatory payday loans. Um, do strongly object to the uh, provision in the draft uh, that exempts uh, these advances from usury caps uh, and don't, also don't think it's appropriate to give unfettered discretion to a regulator to decide what fees should be allowed above the usury cap. Uh, strongly believe that these are a new kind of fintech payday loan. The data is clear that these loans are trapping people in a cycle of debt, 36 to 100 loans a year, 300% uh, APR loans, and as Andrew will discuss, uh, some of the models uh, triggering overdraft fees. Um, the broad definition of earned wage access in, in this draft and in others is broad enough to potentially uh, encompass traditional payday lenders, so we have to be very, very careful uh, that we're not just allowing another kind of high-cost loan. Um, 
It is appropriate, obviously, to, to cap the costs and cap fees. Uh, any cost cap should also be per month and not just per transaction in order to prevent snowballing costs and manipulations to um, push people to take out several advances uh, when they really just want one loan. Uh, there are aspects of the proposal that um, I support. I support requiring the disclosure of an annual percentage rate that includes all fees uh, at all costs, including tips uh, before each transaction and support the, the quarterly disclosure of all costs. Uh, the data, you know, again, shows that the rates on these loans are very high. And with people taking out, you know, dozens a year, or several a month, uh, small costs add up. And it's important to disclose that rate so people can compare. Um, also strongly support including uh, any tips and other so-called so voluntary charges uh, when measuring costs and prohibiting any default or suggested tip or anything that requires the consumer to take affirmative action to opt out. Um, of those costs. Uh, we have seen many manipulations that these lenders have used to push people into taking uh, to paying tips. Um, I've seen um, a video of one user uh, using an app and uh, had to take five different steps in order to undo tips and other costs that the app kept putting in and had to sort of you know, power through eight different messages about why you know they really should tip and why they should feel guilty about tipping. Um, the reviews that talk about they try to trick you into giving them more money. Uh, the first screen is a tip screen. You say zero. Next it loads the advanced screen, which automatically puts in another $10 tip. I won't read the whole review, but um, there are a lot of manipulations there. Um, so, uh, again, strongly oppose exemption from usury caps, uh, but support uh, addressing all these manipulations. Make sure you include expedite fees, too, and focus on uh, all costs that are received by the lender, whether or not they are so-called charged uh, to avoid manipulations there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ryan Naples? Hi, how are you? So, yeah, I represent Daily Pay. Uh, we're a uh, business to business earn wage access company. So, we um, sign contracts with businesses and then we um, take four to six weeks to integrate with their payroll and their time and attendance systems. Uh, and then, everyone on, the, on everyone who works for these companies are able to download these apps, um, download our app. Uh, we get about 36% of people downloading the app. There's um, uh, about 50% of people just watch. To see how much they make because we pull data four times a day so people are able to see how much they make throughout the day and throughout the payroll period um the you know the um the people that do transfer uh do choose to transfer the wages they've already earned i, I do want to be clear that these are not usurious rates these are either zero dollars or um uh for if you can wait until the next day free ach or it's three dollars i do want to also object and, and we have also objected to the california data um, that was released publicly and gets mentioned a lot about this 300% plus um, uh, APR rate. Th this was data that they they only used, there are 20 business to business companies like mine. They um, are far fewer direct to consumer companies and California used uh, three companies that asked for tips. There's only two companies now left in the industry that do ask for tips. And they only used two companies that don't as opposed to the 20. So the data was extremely skewed, which is how they got this 300% because they were not using the correct number of, they were not comparing the correct number of uh, of uh, companies when they were making this calculation. I do also want to say like the data and the research is, uh, shows the opposite of what was just mentioned by the previous, by the previous panelists about how this does help people and the financial health network, which has done panel, uh, discussions and surveys with people who uh, they did not find um, from any company. They just got them from anyone uh, who actually used it um, all showed positive results because you can't compare this and you can't think about this in a vacuum. The people that use us are using us because they're not, otherwise they're going to pay bills late. And so I think the importance of this model bill, which is why we think it's a good thing is it actually sets up right. Like uh, criteria for, uh, disclosures around tips. Right now, there are not there are none. So it's actually strong, helpful disclosures. There's also 
an important strong mechanism to contain to control continue to control the cost because look there are no loans in the country where they're either free or three dollars there are no loans in the country where you can not pay it back and there are no and and there are no record and there is no negative consequences keeping that as the as the the standard for the industry going forward is also really important we think um so that's why i think it's an a good idea for um this model bill to be considered and, and appreciate it and uh hello to all my friends who i see on the zoom we haven't been together in a while so um and i, I do also want to mention in south carolina every single democrat voted for for this um bill in, in both houses i think there are two people who voted against the bill in in the state senate who are republican so the, this is an issue that only be gets that gets codified these are laws and regulations that get codified into law after a great a great deal of discussion and education no one is is rushing to to um to to codify industry best practices we, we want to make sure everyone understands like what what this is and why it why it exists and why it, it helps people so uh we're not trying to rush we appreciate the the conversation um and i will stop talking now happy friday everyone all right up next andrew kushner yes uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, thank you for having me um, i'm andrew kushner at the center for responsible lending we're a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan advocacy and research organization that um, work pred predominantly on predatory lending issues. Um, I second everything that Lauren Saunders said, um, but I'm also going to add just a little bit um, on, on, an, on an issue specifically about um, direct-to-consumer EWA products and debiting of users' bank accounts. So if you look at um, Section 8B4 of uh, the model law, it, um, it it gives to the state regulator uh, the authority to promulgate rules around the debiting of users' bank accounts. Um, I'm going to address that. So just to give a little bit of context, um, I believe my colleague, uh, Monica, talked about this in depth at the NCOIL meeting in, in uh, Nashville, but we recently at CRL did a study based on um, actual transaction data that we received um, through another nonprofit that, um, that looked at overdraft incidents by um, by EWA users, and it actually found that specifically direct to consumer EWA users, it actually found that um, on average users incidents of overdraft increased 56% once they started using the product. Um, and, you know, so that's so so that's part of the context here. Um, you know, our position is that it doesn't make sense for any law to exclude these products from state usury caps, but it especially doesn't make sense as applied to direct to consumer products, um, I put I put in the chat the study by the way. Um, but if you know if the committee um, is going to go down that road, then we would say it absolutely makes sense to have in the law specific restrictions around the debiting um, of of users' bank accounts, um, and that that the companies be allowed to to attempt to collect a single time. If it's unsuccessful in collecting, they're not able to represent that transaction. Um, that makes sense to protect users from overdraft fees that can flow from using these advanced products. And it also is perfectly consistent with industry's narrative um, that they're not offering loans, that, they're, that there's not an obligation to repay these products, right? Um, if they're not loans, um, if there's not an obligation to repay them, if they've tried one time to, uh, to, to get payment from a user's bank account and that's not successful, uh, that should be the end of it, um, on, you know, if, if they're not offering loans um, where there's an obligation to repay. Um, so happy to take questions on that, um, and, uh, and I thank everyone for their time. Next up, we have Molly Jones. My name is Molly Jones. I am the head of public policy at Pay Active. Thank you all so much for the time. I know this is a, a new topic for a lot of people, and it's really nuanced, as I'm, I'm sure you're you're hearing today. We are an employer integrated provider. So we have a contractual relationship with the employer. We integrate directly into the time and attendance payroll system. And we make an accessible balance based on those verified or, uh, earned wages. So again, it's, it's using earned wages that someone has earned and it's not a lending product. I find this can be a very psych, you know, a philosophical issue for people. Some people think that, you know, the biweekly pay cycle is this sort of sacred uh, forced savings device for consumers and that anything you access before payday must then be a loan. That's not the modern world that we're living in with the technology that we have today. 
Uh, and it's certainly not the reality for workers living paycheck to paycheck when you know, you don't need a forced savings device uh, every two weeks. You need to access money that you have earned. You want to pick up a shift at work and be paid immediately afterwards so you can pay a bill, things like that. And this is a, a really highly valued service for employees. Uh, the fees are only voluntary uh, and such an APR calculation is not appropriate. There's a, a handful of very serious issues with the data that has been cited. I'm happy to talk offline further with anyone interested in digging into that. I'll, I'll spare the rest of you because it is pretty wonky. Um, and, you know, there, there's been some statements made that are simply not accurate with how the EWA industry operates. And I think it's certainly fair for all of us to have, you know, appropriate scrutiny of the sector and and to, to wonder how to regulate it. And I think let's take those concerns and put them into the regulation. I heard some things that were um, cited, and those are actually consumer protections that are added into this bill. So I think it's, let's think about the consumer protections here. And I think it's a very high standard model that you're considering. Thank you. So the last person that we have in the queue to speak is Chuck Bell. If anybody else is out there that didn't put their hand up, please do so at this time. So last person, Chuck, take it away. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Chuck Bell. I'm a uh, financial policy advocate at Consumer Reports uh, based in Yonkers, New York, uh, and we represent consumers nationally. Um, I think we are highly concerned that if unless the fees are very low or minimal for the use of earned wage advanced products, that consumers will bear a high net cost at the end of the day. Um, there is research uh, that shows many consumers in every state are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, roughly 30% on average, if you look at the United Way Alice data on this question. And people are chock full in their budget with expenses that they cannot afford to pay. So if we're saying that it's okay to shift two or $300 of the cost of being paid every, you know, it, through an early earned wage advance to consumers, where is the room in that budget going to come from? And the California data that we have does take account of the fact that these are very short-term uh, loans. And that when you include the fees in that, they do have very high equivalent APR rates for many of the products. We're a little more comfortable with the employer integrated model where there's actually um, access to the wage data. But I want to also point out, we're letting employers off the hook. I mean, no, there's nothing stopping employers from giving people early pay at no cost to them. And that would be a better model than shifted, uh, legalizing fintech to payday loans and making it sort of a wild west environment. We're concerned in New York that if you start allowing exceptions to the uh, banking laws, other companies are going to come in and lobby for the same um, holiday from regulation. And with historically, it's been very difficult to keep out the high cost, usurious payday lenders. And for any non-authorizing state, they basically have the same problem, except they have those products are already legal. So um, we do think if there is a model law that um, keeps the fees low, if the caps are low and um, you know tightly enforced, we don't think it should be solely up to the to the regulator, we'd like to know where we're going before these products are legalized and what the costs um, are actually going to be at the end of the day to consumers. There should be stated in the form of an APR equivalent so the consumer can compare that to the other um, credit options that they may have, or they may, and also to get a quarterly statement with the net costs uh, so they know how much they're paying throughout the year for this product and whether there's an alternative way uh, to get that service for. Um, less money. The problem of loan stacking for the business to consumer loans is also a highly significant problem. The study by CRL has found out that 25% of consumers use more than one B2C service, and that multiplies the risks of uh, becoming insolvent, of getting into debt trap, and of incurring overdraft fees. Uh, so we are concerned about that features of the model law uh, and um, we hope that those features could be addressed in further conversations with the advocates and uh, people who are concerned about financial health and stability. All right, I'll now open this up to legislators. Are there any questions or comments from any of our legislators? Again, please jump right in or use the raise hand function on Zoom. Hi, Chair, it's uh, Assembly Member Hunter. I think if uh, folks are following along, obviously, and, and reading some of the stuff in the chat, 
I think, um, and for maybe not for today, since we've had extensive kind of back and forth and we can, we, we hear the sides and understand that it's coming from the industry, the providers who are, who are, who are offering these products and obviously the, the advocates who wanna make sure that there are strong consumer protections. I do feel like there needs to be clarity and I said and again will and the folks for Ncoil if we could maybe find a way to get some of this clarified maybe either in advance of the next meeting or part of the discussion at the next meeting relative to concisely what providers are actually um making folks pay um, because we see it's equivalent to Venmo or PayPal and you're not paying anything. And some people are only paying $3 if they want it early compared to the other conversation relative to all of these fees and mission creep into payday lending. And so I think that there needs to be significant clarity between I work for this, I'm getting my pay early compared to usury rates, high fees, what exactly are all of these other products that potentially we're talking about so that we can be very, very clear? And that's just my comment. We don't have to have a lengthy conversation about that, but I think based on this, the chats going on, that there definitely needs to be significant clarity as to products, fees, and where all of these other 300% of stuff is, is, is coming from. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Um, Assemblywoman Hunter, we were going to turn it over to you for some closing remarks. Um, does any other legislators that would like to speak on this? I think Assemblywoman Hunter like wrapped it up really well for us um, that we do need some clarity. Um, Paul, do you want to go next? Sure. And um, exactly as just as you mentioned, Assemblywoman Hunter kind of covered some of the things and I don't want to add too much, but one of my things hopefully that we look at as we go forward um, is uncovering these fees and not to uh, pick on anybody, but I just had, um, when Molly had mentioned uh, the fees were voluntary, it was something that caught my ear. Um, and that I think going forward is something that we just need to address is, we know that those that are, are advancing the money need to get paid. And so it's figuring out you know, it's uncovering, it's clarity, it's transparency, and hopefully uh, in the months ahead, if this is something that uh, gets entertained, that that transparency is uh, brought forward. So we'll, I'll talk more about it as it goes on. Thank you. Absolutely. Senator Thies? Hi there. Uh, thank you very much. I just, uh, as someone who has had to make use of these things back in a prior life, man, you you need to be careful about how much you're protecting somebody away from their ability to actually have these products. If you make the products impossible to provide, then they're not gonna have access to them. And so it's great that you've protected them, but then they really do have the overdose fees. They really can't purchase their groceries that they needed to purchase for their kids. People get themselves in a bind and they're a risky person to lend to. They may not have the credit cards because they have bad credit. They may not have access to bank accounts because they might not be banked at all. Like they, these are things they're going to be able to need. And I appreciate that you wanna protect them. Uh, financial literacy is absolutely essential in this space. Full transparency is essential in this space, but don't, suggest legislating away from these products being available to people who need them. Thanks. Assemblywoman Hunter, do you want to wrap it up? With some sure, final comments? Sure, thank you. Um, I think I said this in the comment that we had at our annual meeting uh, last year when we first introduced this, and um, these products wouldn't be available if people didn't need them. Um, obviously, that there is a significant, whether it's wage gap, under wages, high inflation, many different factors that are creating a, a scenario where uh, people are enticed to, you know, to be able to need these, need these products. And yes, financial education is definitely important. And, you know, it's, it's hard to make a dollar out of 15 cents. 
Yeah, that was uh, in a song and it, it makes perfect sense. So um, I'm just looking forward to any additional recommendations. I am um, collaborative, love to be able to have chats and, and how we can make this, you know, strong model. And then you take it back to your state and, and, and make it work for, for what works for you. Um, you know, New York is a financial kind of capital around the globe. And I think, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have super strong consumer protections, but it doesn't escape me that we're having this conversation because people are desperately in need and, and these products are out there and we don't want bad actors. We don't want people to prey on, on people who are obviously poor and, you know, need, need these kind of services. We just want to make sure that they're protected and okay. So I definitely look forward to any additional amendments that you have, please send them and Coil's way and we'll walk through them and, and look forward to kind of dicing out a little more clarity at our meeting in California in July. So thank you, Madam Chair. So thank you, Assemblywoman Hunter, and thank you to everybody um, for your participation and comments today. Please be sure to reach out to Assemblywoman Hunter, myself, or NCOIL. Um, with the, to the staff with any question or comments on this model or the previous model that we talked about today. And then does anyone have any other business that they would like to raise today um, before our meeting in Costa Mesa? Any other business that we would like to talk about? Okay, with that, I'd just like to remind everyone that registration for the summer meeting is now open. Um, and if you wanna get registered and then get your hotel, things are gonna be going pretty quick. And please be sure to register and book as soon as you can. The block's going to run out. And with that, hearing no other further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. And then a voice vote. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you for um, coming on today. Thanks, Madam Chair. Everyone have a great weekend. You bet. Bye-bye.